everyone. My Good evening, everyone. My name is Sandra Samuels. I am the president of Jamaica Reach to Recovery. It's a breast cancer group in Jamaica. I will be the, your moderator this evening on behalf of the Jamaica Cancer Society, um, our affiliate, and we will be speaking on breast cancer this afternoon. It's a privilege for us to be able to have the experts online where we can ask various different questions on all the on all the things that we want to know about, well, as much as we can in the two hours that we have been um, afforded to speak, to, to ask questions, burning questions that we have on breast cancer. Now, first up, we invite Ms. Shulian Brown, and she will be bringing greetings from the Jamaica Cancer Society. Good evening, and thank you, Madam Moderator Sandra, from our affiliate to Jamaica Reach to Recovery. It's a pleasure to have another hosting of a breast cancer forum. And one of the key reasons is that the Cancer Society has been around for the last 60 years. We're going to be 79 next year. Hello. Thank you. My, I think my, my 55. And one of our mandates, or our mandate, is to fight and defeat cancer in all its forms. And our mission is to eliminate cancer as a major health problem in Jamaica. And we try to achieve this by hosting public forums, providing free screening for breast, prostate, and cervical cancers, as well as having medical symposium to provide updated information to the medical community as it relates to those prevalent cancers in Jamaica, including colon cancer and lung cancer, so that our physicians are aware of what the new trends are, what the new information is, and so we'll be better able to treat and diagnose their patients. So I'll just take a minute to recognize those persons who are making this event happen this evening. Our ICT Tech, David Miguel and Richard Gooden, PBC Jamaica, who are so graciously through Joan Andrea Hutchinson agreed to live stream us this evening. And of course, we have Miss Sandra Samuels from Jamaica Wish to Recovery, chairperson of Jamaica Wish to Recovery. And of course, Dr. Daria Cornwall, head of the mammography unit at the University Hospital of the West Indies and also the Managing Director of Precision Imaging Center in Crossroads. There's also Dr. Jason Copeland, who is a breast surgical oncologist and a consultant general surgeon at the Kingston Public Hospital. We have Dr. Ms. Sabrina Palomino, who will be on board with us this evening looking at nutrition and cancer. We have Dr. Patrice Toire, or Ms. Patrice Toire, my apologies, who will be looking at patient navigation. And I must make special mention of Stacey Ann Daly from Rush Pharmaceutical and Dion Thomas, who is also a member of staff at the Jamaica Cancer Society and the deputy of the PR and fundraising two-man department. And so, and also like before we begin, to just acknowledge again our dear friend David Miguel, who is on board with us. He's our ICT tech. He lost his wife, Miss Susie Miguel, last year to breast cancer. So this, for him this evening, is both challenging and meaningful. And Sir David, we appreciate having you on board with us. So without further ado, I want to thank each and everyone who has joined us thus far. And this is going to be a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry, Ms. Samuels, I sent you a message to unmute. Can you unmute, please? So sorry. So, so sorry. I thought I unmuted myself. Thank you so much, um, Shulian. And my sincere condolences to you, David. Um, As, you know, a breast cancer survivor of 25 years myself, I do understand what you must have gone through during that period. Uh, we at J Jamaica reached a recovery. Um, you know, we we take over October <laughs> in a major way. This is indeed Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and we are doing everything within our power to get the word out on 
on a sorry oh so no one was seeing me i'm so sorry okay so yes this evening we will be introducing dr daria cornwall consultant radiologist and head of the, mam the mammogram unit at UHWI and Managing Director of Pre Precision Imaging Center. Dr. Daria Cornwall Bernard is from Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Cornwall obtained her degree in medicine at UWI in 1997 and later specialized in radiology. She did sub sub specialty training in breast imaging at Nottingham Breast Institute, UK, in 2009 and is a consultant radiologist at U U UA um, where she is the head of the Women's Imaging Center at University Hospital. She is also an associate lecturer at the University of the West Indies. Dr. Cornwall is a founder and managing director of Precision Imaging Center, Caledonia Crossroads, Kingston, Jamaica, where they do x-rays, ultrasound, digital mammograms, and CT scans. She is the, the Health Ministry's Director of, of Andrews Memorial SDA Church, Kingston, Jamaica. She plays the guitar and enjoys a good game of netball. Dr. Cornwall does pre presentations on cancer awareness, other health top topics for, for numerous organizations. She volunteers with the Jamaica Cancer Society and writes articles for the newspapers, Gleaner, Observer, various magazines on issues related to screening and early detection of cancers. So we welcome Dr. Cornwall over to you now, Doc. Thank you. I am, I am delighted to be here. Uh, should I be able to share? Uh, screen advanced. I am delighted to be here this afternoon to share with, 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 with all of us and myself, you know, reminders about breast cancer screening, breast cancer awareness. Uh, as we know, breast cancer is a major challenge, major issue here in, um, not just Jamaica, but across the world in Jamaica, um, one in every 21 women will is expected to get breast cancer in her lifetime. And that might be a little understatement because globally in the US, for example, it's one in eight. So if there's a room with eight women, one will get breast cancer in their lifetime, 16 women, two, 32 women, four, et cetera. So if you have eight or 80 women in your church, 10 in their life, in the lifetime will get breast cancer. So we want to really raise the awareness. Now breast cancer also happens in men but it's less common. So in Jamaica, it's one out of every 3,000 men will get breast cancer, approximately 3,000. And I know some of those 3,000 men. And we have to pre-talk to them as well because when a man gets breast cancer or a woman, they are the only person in the world that's affected to them. So we are, we are in tune with any man or woman who has been affected by breast cancer and we would like for all to be caught early so that we could give them the best possible outcome. Just like my sister Sandra here is experiencing and living her best life. Uh, so when I speak to screening, I wonder, I just want to stop so that I can explain what the word screening is. Because I know we hear, do your screening, go for your screening test, but I don't know if people understand what the word screening means. And so screening basically is looking for disease in someone who does not have any signs or symptoms of the disease. So let me show you the continuum of the disease. Let's start at the beginning here. There's a point in everybody's life when they have no disease, right? This is at the beginning of the screen. Are you seeing my screen? Okay. And um, so like children, you know, at any, at that point, when you are young, you have no disease, um, and there are kids who are born with disease. So I'm, and this is just not everybody's in this category. Anything that is done when you do, do not have a disease as yet to, to, to prevent it or to push it off is called a primary prevention method. So when the children are born and we give them the MMR and polio vaccines and DPT and all of those vaccines, tetanus, 
um, for us in Trinidad Tobago, yellow fever and all of that. We don't have those things yet and we're trying to prevent it. That's a primary prevention method. When you're eating up your healthy fruits and vegetables and you're avoiding alcohol and smoking and all of that, those are primary prevention methods where you're trying to push off disease. You don't have nothing yet and you're trying to live a healthy lifestyle, exercise, get your vitamin D, eat healthy, get to your ideal body weight, all of those things trying to get to, to prevent disease even if you don't have it, it, it prevent disease you don't have it and you're trying to push it off so that you prevent it from happening to you as much as possible as we get older though some of us for some for some sad types of diseases like cancer some cancers getting older is a risk factor so being for like breast cancer being a woman and getting older is the biggest risk factor for getting breast cancer for a man being a man getting older biggest risk factor for prostate cancer and for men and women being older and being men or women and getting older are big setups for things like colon cancer. So even if you have a healthy lifestyle and everything like that, you are pushing off your risk, but your healthy lifestyle may not be able to allow you to decrease your risk down to 0% because getting older may still give you some element of risk. So if we, as we are getting older, if we are at risk to disease, there's a time when the disease starts when we don't have a clue that it is happening. The disease don't tell me good morning yet. We don't have no lump in the breast, no nipple discharge, no rash on the nipple, nothing to suggest that we have breast cancer or for like prostate cancer, no blood in the urine, for colon cancer, no blood in the stool, etc. So anything that is done to catch these things, whether it be diabetes, hypertension, any type of disease, early to catch it before it starts to give you any symptoms is called a secondary prevention method. And, and screening for disease is looking for disease in someone who don't have no signs or symptoms of the disease, then breast them nice and airy, no lumps, no bumps, no nothing, them looking nice and everything, but you still have to go and check to make sure. So that is what screening does. It's a form of secondary prevention. And when you screen someone who does not have any signs of the disease to see if they have it, then it, the chances are if you catch it, you'll catch it very early and then you get treatment options that could render a cure. The chances of a cure are best that way. Now, if now we don't go do any screening checks and to get any warning signs to see if you could find disease early and you leave it to, 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 to get bigger, to, get, to, 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 to start showing or giving you signs, then anything that is done at that time, when you are diagnosing it at that time, you're really trying to prevent complication. It's tertiary prevention. And the chances of a cure are less likely than if you got it before it started to give you any symptoms. It's like being pregnant. There's a time when women are pregnant and their belly don't start short. They don't even have any morning sickness. At that time, when you do the urine test and you catch it now, that is early. Well, pregnancy is not an abnormality, but I'm just showing you. You screen for pregnancy. We don't screen for pregnancy because pregnancy is not an abnormality. But I'm saying to you, there's a time when everybody, when we are pregnant, we don't know we're pregnant yet. Until now, we start getting morning sickness and we start to have belly start showing and all of that. Right. So if we catch the pregnancy early, it doesn't mean that we're going to get a better pregnancy. But I'm just trying to give you an analogy that screening is looking for something early before we have any signs or symptoms. And in terms of disease, screening for breast cancer helps to pick it up early. Now, how do we reduce the risk of breast cancer? I'm going to just touch on this. Decreasing fat in your diet. Fat helps to increase our body weight and body fat itself. Fat in your body helps to secrete estrogen, which exposes our body to more estrogen than we need. And in some people, estrogen can cause breast cancer. Getting sunlight, exercise in sunlight, exercise helps us to get to our ideal body weight. Exercise also helps to boost our immune system. And in sunlight, because sunlight produces vitamin D, which helps to fight cancer, right? And in us black people, our black skin with the melanin may be a little resistant to the sun. So we find that we may be in the sun all day and our vitamin D level is still low. So we encourage women, we encourage men, everyone, because vitamin D also helps with prostate cancer, colon cancer. We encourage all of us, get your vitamin D level tested. Go to your doctor and tell them to send you. could test it in the blood test. Nutritional D. And if it is low, you start on D3 supplements. And we all knew that D T vitamin D was big during COVID time to help to boost the immunity. Breastfeeding can help, especially if you breastfeed for more than six months, helps to prevent your risk or decrease your risk of breast cancer. Limiting alcohol or no alcohol 
helps to decrease your risk and not smoking, of course, helps to decrease your risk. Um, the one thing with alcohol is that there is no level at which it is good to drink. There's no known, say, okay, you could drink this. This is good enough for you. This is not good for this one. As low as as a limit, as low as a possible level of alcohol use or none at all is best is best in terms of fighting cancer. Now, those are factors you have control over. So you do those things, your healthy lifestyle. Now there are factors you don't have control over, and that is like your gender, being a woman, your age, getting older, your race, black, ethnicity, being black. Black women are more at risk for getting breast cancer earlier than there could be Caucasian-based women, and we tend to get the more aggressive cancers. Now, your genetic, your family history is also a risk you have no control over. We are not, we have no control over the families we were born into. So uh, some women are born into families that have breast cancer genes and breast cancer in the genes. Now, that is a risk factor that you cannot control. So being a woman, being a woman, getting older, being black like myself, being born in a family with breast cancer, those are risk factors that we cannot control. That said, only about 15% of women really have gene, the genetics for breast cancer. Most women who have breast cancer don't have cancer in their family. They simply got it because they are a woman, get, there's a woman getting older, and being a woman and getting older is all you really need to be possibly at risk for breast cancer. So then how do we fix this? How do we sort this out? If it is that God knows that we basically can't 100% decrease the risk of breast cancer. So we are just left to die. We are just left to catch this thing. No, we are just left so. No, we are not. God has put in place tests that we can do to try to catch it early. So let me just show you the breast. This is your breast. The breast is made of like about 20 bunches of grapes. Each bunch of grape has the, each each grape in the, in, in the bunch is, is a lobule. And the milk, really the real function of breast is to make milk. Each, each grape makes milk. The milk comes down a little stem to the main stem and the main stem, which is the duct, brings the milk to the nipple for feed the baby, right? If something starts in the duct, it's a ductal pathology, like a ductal carcinoma is the, if it's cancer starts in the duct. You can have other things in the duct besides cancer, like papilloma in the pipe that brings the milk to the nipple. Then you could have things that start in the, in the grapes, in the lobules, like a fibroadenoma, right? You, or or it, you know, that's mal that's not malignant or a lobular carcinoma starts in the lobules. So the, the where the where the pathology starts determines the name of it. So how is it that we could what is what is what is the hope? What is the fight now? If you can't totally decrease your risk for breast cancer, what do we do? The Lord knew that breast cancer would cause problems in women, so the Lord made this the gave knowledge for the making of a machine called the mammogram. And the mammogram is our friend. The mammogram is your best friend for your breast, right? And this is how the mammogram is. We take two pictures of each breast, at least two, and this is a normal mammogram. Now, why is the mammogram so important? Now, how is it? What, what, what about the mammogram? The mammogram can actually pick up lumps two years to three years before the lumps can be felt. Two to three years before the lumps can be felt. And also the mammogram can pick up some cancer start by looking at little grains of salt or calcifications where the mammogram is the first, first, the best way to pick up these calcifications is with a mammogram. And this is a patient with a mammogram that shows this little grains of salt, this calcification, you see little specks of looking like sand. And this is an early cancer. This is so early that the patient didn't feel any lump because it, it didn't reach the stage to form a lump as yet. And the mammogram is the only thing that could pick this up. Now, so we don't want women to wait on a lump because when you have a lump, the mammogram looks like this. This is a lump. By the time we find this, the woman already feels a lump and the chance that it may have started to spread is there. We're just not very sure, but we still will give the woman the best possible treatment that we have. But we know that the earlier we catch a cancer um, is the best fighting chance that that woman has. So the mammogram can pick up lumps early. Now, how do we get these calcifications? This is the pipe that brings the milk to the nipple. Right. Look, let's, let's let's pretend it is like a PVC pipe, the duct that the baby gets the milk from. The walls, the, the cells that line the duct or the pipe, they don't and they don't last forever. 
every so often you change yourself. They shed into the loom and it's like, you know, you have PVC pipe and it has hard water and the hard water cake up and you have the white cakes flakes inside of the pipe. It's the same thing in the ducts that brings the milk to the nipple. Um, the cells shed into the lumen and then new cells take over. And if the cells that shed are benign cells, they, when they, 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 they calcify, we could look at the pattern of calcification and tell you whether the calcification is the pattern of a cancer or the pattern of something benign. The mammogram is the best thing to show these calcifications. So look at this. You see these calcifications here? These are cancer calcifications. We look at them, they are pleomorphic, right? We know that this looks like cancer. This is another type of calcification in a lobule, popcorn calcification. See, it looks like the shape of a grape. This is a calcification in a lobule. And we know that this is a calcified fibroadenoma. This is another benign type. So this is benign. This is benign. The rod-shaped calcification in something called plasma cell mastitis. So when we look at the mammogram, the pattern of the calcification tells us what caused the calcification, whether it is cancer or not. Okay? So mammogram is the best way to... And this is early cancer because these calcifications are still in the duct where they were form they didn't burst out into the into the in, out yet out through the wall of the duct to see outside and become invasive so the mammogram is the thing that can pick up the ductal carcinoma inside too and mammograms are quick and easy to perform and cost effective so this is a patient that i had with breast cancer caught very early as some grains of salt some little little tiny grains of salt and those this was ductal carcinoma inside so now i tell you about this patient when we found this cancer we took her to surgery because we had to do, we couldn't feel the lump, so we, and we couldn't see this on ultrasound. So we had to put in a hook wire to the area under the mammogram and then take the patient to theater for them to take out this area. When we took this area out, we brought her back to clinic. It was cancer. So she went to clinic and the doctor said, I have two news for you, good and bad. What is the news? What is the, which one you want first? She said, give me the good news first, the bad news first. So I said, the bad news is that we found cancer. Right. And then she says, so what is the good news then? What? There's no good news in that. He said, no, the good news is that we found the cancer so early that you don't need nothing else. You don't need no chemo. You don't need no radiation. You don't need to take off your breast. You don't need you don't need anything. So you would think that she's happy. She was happy. But then she came back to us at the clinic and said, doc, you know, say I can't say thing, you know, me get the thing. But and 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 and, and you know, them tell me, say, I don't need no surgery. So i am glad enough, but me I wonder if they might under treat me because other people who come with me, they might get surgery and me not get none. So I I I am not sure if I trust them, you know, so I'll come over. So that's why I'm gonna come over back to, to, the, to the clinic to tell you, say, that they're not doing any surgery. Then they're not giving me no chemo, no radiation, they're not giving me anything. So I said to her, You have a good problem. We want to catch cancer in women so early that they don't need no set of big money for chemo and those kind of things. You have a good problem. So she went back over there, she told her to, they sent for something called the receptor testing. And it came back as estrogen, so they said they would put her on tamoxifen. So she went on her tamoxifen, and she's fine now. She's quite fine, okay? She's fine. So we don't want anybody to wait. As a matter of fact, this same lady, her sister, because this lady was in her 50s, her sister was in her 50s as well going to 60s and her sister refused to do her mammogram because she said me you lucky me no one if anything are happening to me i don't want to i don't want to me not going to do none she not doing none and she refused to come and do her mammogram and as fate would have it because she's getting older and then now she has a sister with breast cancer but they're both getting older because the sister was the first to get it in her family you know that the sister who didn't do the mammogram felt alone i'm telling you she felt a lump about two, three years after the sister was diagnosed with cancer. And by the time we found that sister's cancer, it had already started to spread. So now she had to get chemo. She had actually had to get chemo and before the surgery. And then she had surgery and then chemo after. And, she's, and you know, so her treatment was much more extensive than the other sister. So we want you to do the mammogram so that you can catch the cancer early. Now I'm going to go back to the mammogram, because there's a little thing I want to tell you about screening. In addition to getting your mammogram done, you should also do your breast self-examination, where you, we don't really call it that again, we call it breast self-awareness, where you examine your breast every month to see if there's any lump. And this should start from teenagers, women and men alike, from teenage coming up to start to do your breast self-examination, especially after the period for women and for men, you do it once a month at any time. 
Now, if you feel a lump, you must get it checked. That is in your 20s, 30s, coming up, get it checked. When you've reached the age to do your mammogram, even if the breast feels normal, you'll start to do your mammogram to make sure that your breast is normal for truth. And I'll tell you the age to start that. Now, when you've started doing your mammogram, even if you're doing your mammogram, you must still feel the breast, examine your breast every month and be aware because there are some blind spots that the mammogram cannot pick up. For example, under your arm, we can't see everything way up under your arm. Okay, on the mammogram. Sometimes even on the middle between your two breast bone, your collarbone, there's a little bit of breast that come towards the collarbone that you, we can't pick up. The mammogram won't pick that up, right? Any cancer in between the, between your two breast stem in the, in, the, in the edge there, there are some areas that the mammogram won't pick up. So we want women, even when they start doing the mammogram, to examine your breast every month after the period. And if you don't have period, just choose a time. If you're in menopause, just choose a time and check it. Because there are some cancers that may hide from the mammogram because of where they are located. Anytime you feel any lump in your breast or any nipple discharge or anything with your breast, even if the mammogram is normal, go back to the doctor and tell the doctor, say, I need an ultrasound. Right, because the two things work hand in hand to help to pick up cancers. So we want you to be aware. Mammogram, yes, but also examine your breast. And if you feel any change, your doctor should send you additionally for an ultrasound. Okay? So let's move on. When to start mammogram screening and how often? If you're 40 years, you know, you, if you don't have breast cancer in your family, none. Your family is just sugar and pressure kill your grandmommy. As a matter of fact, your grandmother died from old age at 101. If you have no cancer in your family, then you start your mammogram at 40. And right now, people, them, I see so many cancers in women in their 30s that we are tempted to say, if you don't come from cancer family, start your mammogram at, 30, at 35. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I had three women with breast cancer, 28, 29, 30. And it's only the 29 year old had cancer in her family. The other two did not. As a matter of fact, the 30 year old felt a lump she, from she was 28 when she had her baby, but she thought it was a milk lump. And then she do have cancer in her family and she's young. So she didn't, so what am I going to do to doctor to check lump? At 28, I'm not an old woman. I'm not big, I'm not even 30. So she felt it wasn't getting bigger. The lump wasn't getting bigger. She kept feeling it. And then when she reached 30 now, she said, she come because she reached 30 now. She said, okay, me kind of like a bigger now. But you know, that, can, that lump was a cancer and it had already spread to her arm and to her lungs by the time we diagnosed it. So don't ignore any sign in your breast. Do it every year, every 365 days. When to stop? There is no age to stop. You do not have, you can do a mammogram at 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. I have ladies in their 90s and 80s doing mammogram and we catch some very early cancers in them and we get them sorted out. They all do radiation and chemo and all sorts of things and going on good, good. Once you have health and strength and could take the treatment if a cancer is found, do your mammogram. So how to prepare for a mammogram? Remember I told you some cancers look like little grains of salt. So on the day of your mammogram, do not put on any perfume, lotion, deodorant, or powder on your breast, on your upper body, or under your arm, because they may have these little grains of salt or calcifications in them that confuse the picture. So don't put on these. Walk with it and put it on after. On the day of your mammogram, wear two piece outfit. It's always easier to take off a top than the dress but if you wear your dress don't make your dress stop you from doing your mammogram do and do your mammogram please i beg you also bring the previous film so if you used to do your mammogram at mary jane's place and then you start doing it at john hopkins place or wherever borrow the x-rays or the mammograms from that other place to to take it to the new place because we tend when we are radiologists when we are looking at the images we look at the previous one to, and we could spot differences more quickly when we have a previous one to compare now, I talked about people who start at 40 and maybe 35 to do their mammogram. There are people who should start much younger. Women who have the, and the breast cancer genes in their family, like Angelina Jolie's, should start their mammogram at age 30 and add MRI to it. Women who have the genes for breast cancer in their family, they don't even have to test themselves for the genes. Once it's in your family, you could turn up your pot and know that cancer is coming. Also, women who had lymphoma and had mantle radiation to the chest should get their mammogram, should start their mammogram 10 years, eight years after they've 
completed the radiation. That is women who had like lymphoma, you know, the Hodgkin's and the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. When they had, if they had it between the age of 10 and 30, they would have to sometimes treat them with chest radiation. And that radiation is a very high dose and that could cause cancer. And so those women should start their mammogram eight years after they completed the radiation. Now, there are some women who don't have the genes for cancer in their family, but somehow they find that people in their family have ovarian and breast cancer. So I have laid a patient, two patients. One, so she had breast cancer at 45, and she told me her sister had breast cancer at 36. As a matter of fact, her sister was already there. This is a patient I had last week. So if you find that you have any two or so first degree relatives with breast cancer diagnosed before 50, that is young. Anybody who get cancer before 50, that's young. You must then start your mammogram 10 years earlier than the, 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 the date, that the age that the younger person was diagnosed. So my patient who had a, her mommy had breast cancer at 40, she had breast cancer at 45 and her sister had breast cancer at 36. Her first degree relatives like her children should start their mammogram at 26, 10 years younger. Right? I'm wrapping up now, 10 years younger. There are a couple myths that I'm going to just close off with. That breast cancer cannot happen if your breast is small. No truth. Even if you have teenage-sized breasts, you could still get breast cancer, do your mammogram. Only woman with a family history at risk, you know that already. Being a woman and getting older is all you need. So no family history doesn't take away all your risk. You still need to do it because you're getting older. Women say that if I have dense breasts and do an ultrasound, I could do an ultrasound instead of a mammogram. That is not true. When we look at your mammogram, we look to see how much glands you have that make milk. The more glands you have that make milk, which means it, we say that your breast is dense. The more glands you have, since some of the cancers like the glands, the more glands you have, the more your risk of breast cancer. And the thing is that the cancers in the dense breast tend to have the same shade of white like the glands, so they could hide. So this is a cancer in a fatty breast. You see the fat looks gray. Here the patient have a little bit of glands. It's hiding the cancer, but we could still kind of see it. This is a patient with a heterogeneously dense breast. It's hiding the cancer. And this one is very dense, hiding the cancer. So when you have a patient, when we say your breast is dense, it simply means you have a lot of glands that make milk. And women who have more glands are at increased risk for getting breast cancer. So the, And those cancers could hide in the glands on the mammogram. So we have to back them up with an ultrasound because in the ultrasound, the glands look white, but the cancers look dark. Okay, so we back it up with an ultrasound. And so some women say, okay, so when I come and do a mammogram, I have to do an ultrasound. Why do the mammogram? And as a matter of fact, some doctors tell the patients don't send, don't do a mammogram because they're breast dense. No, we have to do the mammogram because not all the cancers look the same shade like the glands. Some cancers start like looking like grains of salt. And if you could see the grains of salt or the calcifications is a different shade of white to the glands and the glands can't hide them. And it's the only thing that could show them is the mammogram. And if we didn't do the mammogram in the woman with dense breast and we only did the ultrasound, then we would miss the chance to see the cancers that are looking like grains of salt um, um, before they could form a lump. Because if we leave these, they would eventually form lump like you're making dumpling. You have salt and flour and water and you form lump. Well, if we leave these calcifications, they'll get up the tissue and form lump. By that time, it may have spread. So the mammogram can show us those calcifications and let us catch the cancer early in the dense breast. Same thing here, dense breast calcifications, we could see them. One last minute, thermography. That could replace mammogram. Thermography cannot replace mammogram. I won't even get into that because I don't have much time. Thermography can not detect cancer early. The only thing proven to detect cancer early is mammography. If you want to do a thermogram after you do your mammogram, that's, that's fine, but make sure you do your mammogram. Annual mammograms expose you to so much radiation that they increase your risk of cancer, not true. The radiation dose is very low. I won't go into that. It doesn't give you, the dose you get from when you do a mammogram is equivalent to the small dose you get where from living on earth for the last three months, background radiation. Or if you took a trip from here to New York, you're exposed to radiation and that little bit of radiation is what you get when you do a mammogram, it won't kill you. Last one, if you maintain a healthy weight, exercise, eat healthy, limit alcohol, you don't have to worry about breast cancer. 
That has some truth in it, but you still have to worry about breast cancer because doing these things will push it off, but you are not sure if your age is pushing you to cancer more than your lifestyle is pulling you away from it. So when you've reached the appropriate age, you must do your mammogram. Must, even if you're believing, even if you're a Christian, you preach on the pulpit, you're a prayer warrior, go and do your mammogram. Cancer is personal. A sister, a daughter, a mother, a wife. Cancer does not discriminate. You could have just been, you could have do PhD, LLB, MBBS, whatever it is. You could be doctor, lawyer, preacher, pope. Early detection is vital. Outcomes are better. Patient returns to productivity sooner. The costs are lower. You can be guaranteed to live your nice long life if we catch it early. We want you to, don't fear breast mammogram. Don't fear mammogram. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Once you get breasts, regardless of the size, you got boobs, get them checked. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. <coughs> Dr. Cornwall. That was a very informative session. Um, I know many persons may have some burning questions, but we are going to take the questions at the end of the program. Um, you know, you are talking about being being proactive. You, your health is your wealth, and the individuals must take that decision to go out and get themselves checked, to get their mammograms done, and to be proactive about their lifestyle and their life choices. Now, to speak more on that, we are going to invite Dr. Pernell Bell, um, who is a counseling psychologist, and she'll be speaking on taking a proactive action towards one's health. Welcome. Let's welcome her this afternoon, this evening, I should say. Welcome, okay. Dr. Bell. Thank you. Do I have sharing privileges? Yes. Yes, you, yes, you do. David will, will assist you shortly. Okay, let me see if I can find my presentation. Okay. All right, good afternoon, good night, everyone. As you heard, I'm Dr. Pernell Bell, and I have been tasked with looking at health and wellness, taking proactive action towards good health and wellness. And I must say to Dr. Cornwall, very, very, very good presentation, excellent information, and well presented. I will just piggyback on some of what she said earlier um, in terms of health and wellness. But let's talk health and wellness because we, we need to talk about health and wellness because sometimes what happened is that in recent years, we have had a change or an addition to the Ministry of Health title the, um, with Ministry of Health and Wellness. And so for me, it begs the question, as it seems to me that health and wellness is one and the same, but not exactly. And so what is health? So the World Health Organization defines health as a state of both physical, mental, and social well-being, and is not merely the absence of disease or illness. So we want to take a note of what health is. And then what is wellness? It's really defined as an optimal state of health in both individuals and groups. And wellness is a positive approach to living. So we want to be care um, to get that definition clear. It's that positive approach to living. So 
we all strive for good health. But how do we achieve good health is what wellness is asking about. We achieve good health through the process, through the process of wellness, doing positive things that will help us to achieve good health. So that's what wellness is. It's really our activities, the positive things that we're going to be doing to have that ultimate goal of good health. So the truism here is that we cannot achieve good health without the practice of wellness. So that's how um, health versus wellness. Health is our goal. And wellness is how we attain the good health. So we want to be careful. When we think health, we treat disease such as diabetes, hypertension, cancer, breast cancer, and so on. When we think wellness, we think of activities that promote health. So, for example, if you take a look at my um, screen, you will actually see some things that would constitute wellness activities. Some things that would constitute wellness activities. And Dr. Conwell spoke to some of those in terms of wellness, exercise, good nutrition, making sure that you do your screening. Those are all proactive ways or wellness activities that would lead to good health if we begin to practice those. So how do we become proactive in, for example, preventing breast cancer? Well, when we think of wellness activities to reduce our risk of breast cancer, we're thinking of lifestyle changes. We are thinking of how do we control the risk factors that um, Dr. Cornwall spoke to. How do we focus on the kind of nutrition that we're going to be um, taking in to ensure good health and, and our spiritual well-being? We should want to leave that out as well as how we focus on a balanced diet. So these are wellness activities that could lead to good health. So how do we, we then prevent, for example, breast cancer or reduce our chance or the risk of having it? We want to make lifestyle changes. And lifestyle changes are choices we make that influence our lives in some way. So we want to ensure that we understand how our own lifestyle and what we are needing to do to ensure that we are reducing our chance of, of, of getting cancer or eliminating it, um, so to speak. So lifestyles are really habit changes that promote positive changes that result in wellness and good health. So lifestyle, what habits are we developing that is going to lead us into good health? What is our sleeping pattern? Eating tendencies that we have, level of physical activity or activities that we engage in. How do we manage our stress? All of those constitute lifestyle habits that will lead to good health. But it's not so easy when we talk about lifestyle changes. It's not so easy to incorporate wellness practices in our lifestyle. So what we can begin to do is to ask, how is my current lifestyle impacting my health? What changes can I make? And the key is to start small. Make simple, realistic changes if we are going to achieve good health. We want to look at, rather than taking on a whole bunch and become overwhelmed with all these lifestyle changes, we want to take one behavior at a time, 
would be a good approach to achieving that good health. Trying to do everything all at once could become overwhelming and we don't want that. So wellness practice means knowing, for example, the risk factors. That's what wellness practices mean. And some of the um, risk factors that Dr. Cornwell spoke to would be, what do we know? Because even though we are actually saying these are the risk factors, how do we personalize this for our own good um, health? And Dr. Cornwell again spoke to being female, increasing age, personal history of breast conditions, a personal history of breast cancer, a family history of breast cancer, and that inherited genes that increase the cancer risk, radiation exposure, and obesity are risk factors. Again, where do we, if we're talking about wellness activities, how do we then help ourselves to better understand these risk factors and then reduce the risk? How do we mitigate these risks? And again, that was dealt with. And I will not go over that, but we, as a part of our wellness, we need to understand these risk factors so that we can take steps again to help ourselves. Nutrition is also a very important way. Again, we talked about um, lifestyle changes and taking proactive action to reduce breast cancer by early detection because it saves lives. As a matter of fact, the World Health Organization says that early diagnosis can improve breast cancer outcomes and survival rates. So we want to know how we are, what our risk factors are, and then again promote we, we talked earlier again about the breast cancer screening. Very important that we have that as part of our wellness activities that we would want to um, take part in. Again, age is the factor. Are we aware of the age and are we doing what we need to do to carry out those um, wellness activities? Now, when we think about all that we said in terms of promoting being proactive in teaching wellness activities, many times there are barriers to us even wanting to take part in some of these wellness activities, especially even screening, as was spoken of in by Dr. Um. Cornwall. None of us want to hear bad news, and so maybe that's why we are so in trepidation. But we should not shy away from doing our yearly checks, even when we are aware of the risk factors. We fear because it's natural. We want to know that, yes, if there is going to be trepidation about a possible diagnosis, but Fear and anxiety cripples us into inaction. So that's the psychological piece. When we become fearful, it cripples us. We're not going to take any action. And inaction ultimately results in undiagnosed conditions. Undiagnosed conditions could lead to the spread of a disease. And the spread of the disease leads to poor, poor prognosis, ultimately death that could have been avoided. So we want to overcome those barriers to taking the steps towards good health. Screening, again, leads to early detection, as we heard earlier. So that initial anxiety of hearing a possible diagnosis will turn into action. And action ultimately results in a diagnosed condition a diagnosed condition leads to reduction in the spread of the disease. And early detection of disease leads to good prognosis, ultimately 
an extension of life and the quality of life. So psychologically, we should try to overcome these fears and anxieties around doing those wellness activities that we are encouraged to take on. Again, one way of overcoming the barriers to cleaning and taking those other um, proactive is lifestyle changes and those lifestyle changes. So we should avoid what is called in psychology, cognitive distortions. That is prediction. We don't get the test done yet, but we are actually saying may have the cancer and predicting. You catastrophize not knowing, but you are again looking at the worst possible outcome. And even when you hear good, you're filtering out and attaching yourself mostly to what you're hearing that is not so good in moving forward to take action towards good um, health. It's counting the positives. So we don't want to do that. What we want to do is face our fears and accept the reality and recognize that knowledge is power. Having knowledge gives us insight for good actions so that we can also make informed decisions rather than emotional decisions. Because when we make emotional decisions, we are actually using our emotional center of the brain and not our wise mind. And usually making the emotional decisions, those decisions may be decisions that have a negative outcome. So we want to make decisions using our wise mind. So we want to be proactive, make li lifestyle changes. Let's know our risk factors. And part of our wellness is to ensure that we do that breast screening that we spoke about earlier on. Talk about doing the things like that, um, getting your mammogram done, following those guidelines and knowing the importance of regular breast examination. Very, very important. So if I were to ask you, what, what's your current health and wellness profile? How would you answer? Do you know? Do you know? What are your health goals? Make a note of those. Make a note of your health goals. And what are your wellness goals as or health goals as it relates to breast cancer and understanding that? So we want to, if we are proactive, we want to set health goals. And that may sound like very strange, but this is something that we want to set as a goal. We want to ask the question too, what are your current wellness practices? Are you processing that? What are your current wellness practices? What's your current lifestyle as it relates to exercise, diet, nutrition, sleep patterns, stress management? Score yourself on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being very good on these wellness practices. What would you give yourself for exercise, for a diet, your nutrition level? What's going on with your sleep pattern and as you are managing stress? What's going on with that? We want, again, to be making sure that we're making these reflections. So what lifestyle changes can you make? That's another question you want to ask. What lifestyle? You have heard this presentation, the previous presentation, and this presentation now. How are you scoring in terms of what has been said? What lifestyle changes can you make? As you look at your risk factors, what is it that you now need to do? Or all of us, we should say, need to do 
as we understand the risk factors for um, breast cancer and other health issues. Do you know your risk factors? How old are you? Do you know your age of higher risk for breast cancer? Do you have a personal history of breast conditions? Do you have a personal history of breast cancer? Is there a family history? You want to again look the comparative. Do you know if you have inherited genes for a breast cancer? And have you been exposed to radiation? Or are, are you obese? We want to again be proactive in looking at these risk factors and take some action. Have you screened for breast cancer? You just had that presentation earlier. Have you screened? How old are you? Have you done a mam mammogram yet based on your age? Do you do regular breast cells examination? Do you ask your doctor to do a professional self-examination? So just remember that early screening leads to prevention and detection, early treatment, and better prognosis. So my question to you as we talk about being proactive to wellness and good health as our goal, what is your wellness plan? What is your wellness plan? Let's start today to put our wellness plan into place, be proactive so that we can live a healthy life, free from certain ailments as we take wellness steps towards good health. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really very, very informative. It made me start thinking about the questions I need to ask myself. And, you know, as much as we like to speak on, you know, we want to be healthy, do we actually get up and move? Do we watch what we're putting in our mouth? Do we, you know, take the time out to make our health a priority. You know, um, a lot of persons don't think that going to a psychologist is also um, at the top of their list of things to do. But I can tell you that your mental health, your mental stability, your mental fitness is one of the most important important things outside of eating and exercise that you will need to get through anything in life, any challenge. Cancer is one of those things also that you want to ensure that mental, there's mental toughness because half, or should I say three quarter of the battle is won here. So thank you very, very much, Doc. That was very informative. Um, please, um, everyone, stay to the end so you can ask the experts the questions. We're asking everybody who presented, please also stay towards the end. We It's only until 8 o'clock, so we, we are not going to be here forever because I know you have burning questions that you'd like to ask um, at this time. And it's, 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 it's a privilege that we have everyone in one space. So you please just stay online and I want to welcome at this time, we are now 97, 98, 99 strong and counting. So for those of you who were not on earlier, <clears throat> you missed Dr. Cornwall, but I know it's being recorded so you can possibly watch the, <clears throat> the recording after the program is finished and uploaded on the Jamaica Cancer Society site. That because it was very, very informative and I know you do not want to miss it. Now, coming up next, we have, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce another doctor, Dr. Jason Copeland, who he is a breast surgical oncologist and consultant general surgeon 
at the Kingston Public Hospital and St. And, and St. And Andrews, sorry, Memorial Hospital. He's also, um, I, I must um, also add that he's also a director of the Jamaica Reach to Recovery. And we are so happy to have him because he's a wealth of knowledge. And he is here tonight to speak to us on will the declining birth rate lead to an increase of breast cancer? And I know that must be a very touchy topic. So without any further ado, I would like to hand over to Dr. Jason Copeland. Welcome, Doc. Hi, good night, everyone. Um, thank you, Sandra, for your kind introduction. And um, thanks to the Jamaica Cancer Society for the invitation to present. And congratulations on another successful public forum. Um, yes, I have been given the task of speaking about um, the will the decline in birth rate affect would increase the risk, sorry, of breast cancer in our population. Now, you know, by my own admission, you know, this has become even more topical um, recently, um, based on one of the one of the interviews I did with the Jamaica Observer we generated quite a bit of discussion about the birth rate and the link between the declining birth rate and breast cancer. Um, so yes, I'm a breast surgical oncologist and um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about breast cancer in general first before we delve a little closer into that topic. Um, so when we speak about breast cancer, what is important for us to understand is that it is not just a single disease. We now understand that it's really a group of diseases that are quite similar. But in this group, the cells have sort of developed the ability to evade the normal control mechanisms of the body. And these abnormal cells develop the ability to invade close but nearby structures. They can also spread to distant organs. So they may develop in the duct and the glandular structures of the breast, but they can spread to the bone, to the liver, to the brain, et cetera. So that essentially is what breast cancer is. So what I want persons to understand is really a group of disease, we call it a heterogeneous disease. Now, I know some of this would have been mentioned before, but globally, it is the most common cancer diagnosed in women worldwide, over 2.2 million cases um, reported in 2022 based on the Global Cancer Observatory data. Beyond that, it is the leading cause of morbidity or complications from cancer in women worldwide. A large problem that we face is that in low and middle income countries, and Jamaica is classified as a middle income country, the burden of the disease is felt more acutely we have a higher breast cancer mortality rate than is what is commonly reported in some of these high income countries or first world countries. The, what we call the case fatality rate, the likelihood of a woman diagnosed with breast cancer in Jamaica, so common to the disease is about two to three times what it is in the US. Many, many reasons for this, including the fact that we see patients that have more aggressive breast cancer, we see twice the rate of triple negative breast cancer. So the biology of the cancers that we see are completely different. And we also see patients presenting quite late. And there's been a lot of talk about breast cancer screening. And this is extremely important because about 40% of the patients that we see when they present to us are presenting with what we call locally advanced or stage three breast cancer. So that is quite late in the presentation and patients who present that late tend not to do as well as patients who present earlier. Also, the treatment of the disease is more disfiguring when patients present late. Surgically, they're much more likely to get complete mastectomy, where often they may not be able to get reconstruction. They may have to get axial lymph node dissection, which increases the risk of things like lymphedema and stuff like that. Also, they're much more likely to require radiation therapy. 
and chemotherapy. So when patients present later, the treatment is far more com complicated, it's far more expensive, and far more disfiguring. And overall, these patients do worse. So we really want our patients to be presented much earlier, and that is where screening is extremely important, which has been mentioned um, by the other presenters before. Uh, Dr. Copeland, remember to go into the slideshow, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought that we were progressing. We're not progressing? Well, you are progressing with your wealth of knowledge, but <laughs> we weren't able to follow your slides. Ah, my apologies. I Let me stop this and see if we can... Um, um, I thought that we were all in the same one here. Let's try this again. Are you seeing my screen? Um, still not sharing. Still, yes, we are seeing you. You are sharing, but you are not in slideshow. Oh, still not in slideshow. Not yet. I do apologize. Are we? Um, not yet. Oh, but it's time like to change manually. Is it? Sorry, David, is it changing? Uh, no, not yet. Um, click on use presenter view and let's see what happens in the... Um, I'm using a backup device and I'm so sorry. I think this is... Um... All right, so make sure your, your main device is the one that is what you will see, um, not number two, but number one. Yeah. Okay, that should be it now. Yes, that's it. Okay, I think I'd finish with this slide. Okay, are, are we seeing the one with the, um, the pie chart? Yes, we are. Okay, great. So, um, well, let's talk specifically about breast cancer in Jamaica. Now, commonly, you know, we hear about a one in eight risk, lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. What I want to stress is that that is not what we see locally. Now, our figures is more one in 15 or 7% lifetime risk for the average Jamaican woman developing breast cancer in her lifetime, which means that, yes, the incidence of breast cancer in Jamaica is less than what it is, for example, in North America. But as I mentioned before, the case fatality rate is twice as high, and that is what is really important. Secondly, the projection for um, breast cancer incidence in Jamaica and other middle-income countries is that it is going to increase over the next 25 years or so. Now, as these countries become more urbanized and adopt more westernized um, lifestyle, diet, 
and reproductive patterns, we find that the breast cancer incidence in this population will increase. Again, based on global cancer observatory data, we had 1,327 estimated cases of breast cancer diagnosed in Jamaica in 2022. If you look at the pie chart, you'll realize that approximately 35% of all cancers diagnosed in Jamaican women were breast cancer in that year. This was more than um, uterine cancer, colorectal cancer, and cervical cancer combined. So by a far, far away, breast cancer remains the most common cancer being diagnosed in our women. So I did a quick comparison between the 2018 and the 2022 data from the Global Cancer Observatory. And we are seeing, already seeing, that increasing trend in the incidence and also the death rates associated with breast cancer. So we are already seeing that. A lot has been said about risk factors for breast cancer. I just want to highlight that it is a very complex interaction among the risk factors such as hereditary factors, genetics, you know, gene mutations, family history, um, lifestyle such as obesity, um, alcohol abuse, um, sedentary lifestyle, environmental factors relating to exposure to radiation treatment, and of course, hormonal or reproductive, which is where we'll talk about, we we'll spend a lot of time talking about. So this is very complex, and there's no single risk factor here that we believe is causative, perhaps with the exception of a few patients who have certain genetic mutations where their risk of developing breast cancer is about 70% lifetime. So reproductive factors, and some of these I know have already been mentioned, now pregnancy, and not just pregnancy, but the completion of pregnancy, having a live birth, it reduces the risk of developing breast cancer in an individual female by about 25% when compared to those patients, persons who have not had a live birth. We've also found that younger age of first pregnancy and the greater number of children per female is also somewhat protective when it comes on to certain types of breast cancer, not all types of breast cancer, but in particular, the hormone receptor positive types of breast cancer that develops um, and in the postmenopausal setting. So pregnancy in the long term is protective, especially for the hormone receptor positive types of breast cancer. Younger age of first pregnancy and the greater number of children tend to be protective. Now, these were found out on basically population-based studies. What that means is that if you follow a group of women with these factors who have had children, you know, uh, many kids and they have them earlier, they're less likely to develop breast cancer. It doesn't mean, however, that because somebody has had a child early or they have many kids that they cannot develop breast cancer. That's not what I'm saying. It's a relative risk comparison. And we're saying that the risk in that population is slightly lower than in patients who have never had children before. We also recognize that feeding reduces the risk of developing certain types of breast cancer as well. And on the opposite side, the use of oral contraceptive pill slightly increases the risk of breast cancer. So what is the effect of the fertility rate on breast cancer? Or is there an effect? Now, the birth rate in Jamaica, we have, no we have noted, has been decreasing over the last <clears throat> Um, 40, 40, 50 years. Now, this is based on um, data from the Jamaica Population Health Status Report. And they have shown that the birth rate or the crude birth rate has declined from 21.7 per 1,000 population in 2000 to about 11.4 at the last check in 2022. So this is a significant decline in the, the local birth rate. Um, this is another UN projection showing here that we are now in 2024 and we're looking at about, um, the, the reported here is about 14 point something um, per thousand. But the overall trend is what we want to look at. You can see it here in the blue that historically the trend in terms of birth rate trend has been decreasing steadily. Now, there are other persons who have looked at the relationship between decreasing birth rate and the breast cancer incidence. And there's a global population-based incidence study that was 
um, done in Switzerland. And they compared the breast cancer incidence and the crude birth rate. And what they found, or what they published was this curve here as a nonlinear curve that shows that as the birth rate falls, the breast cancer incidence actually increases in most of the populations. Now the relationship, I will admit is complex and there are other things to look at as well. Other risk factors that were mentioned, including things like um, obesity, alcohol abuse, smoking, or contraceptive pill use, especially in women who have never had kids before. So these are all confounding in um, these reports. But what they found that was pretty consistent was that as the birth rate decreased, there was a consistent relationship to an increase in the breast cancer incidence in these populations. So this is not something that is unique to us. Now, we have spoken a bit about um, the risk of developing breast cancer. What I want to highlight here is that we can actually do an individual breast cancer risk assessment. Once a woman is over the age of 30, she can have a risk assessment done based on her personal history, her family history, a baseline mammogram, and we put that in a computerized model, and we can actually give an estimate, a prediction of her likelihood of developing breast cancer in her lifetime. We can then use that estimate to make specific um, tailored recommendations for her screen. And I'll give two examples here. Now, I used um, a typical patient. She was 54 years old. Um, this patient, she had two children. Um, first one was at age um, 22, no family history of breast cancer, no personal history of breast cancer. Her baseline mammogram had a density that was heterogeneous to dense. Um, so when we put her in the algorithm, it actually showed that her lifetime risk of developing breast cancer was 8.8%, and the average population risk for comparison was 8.6%. So this person would say is that average risk of developing breast cancer, you can note here the high risk line is at about 20%, and she's well below that, and the average population, 54-year-old woman, is also well below that with those parameters. So when we shifted, and the only thing that we changed in the algorithm was that this is now a 54-year-old lady who is not a parent, so she's never had kids. All the other parameters are the same. No family history of breast cancer, same weight, same height. Everything else remains the same. And her lifetime risk of developing breast cancer now is 11.6%. It's about a 30-something percent increase compared to the patient before who already had two kids, first one being at age 22. So what I'm saying is that we can actually, for each individual woman, we can do an individual risk assessment to better understand that person's risk. And one of the things that we are showing here is that, yes, the lack of having a child actually increases the risk. It is not a high risk, it's somewhere between 25 and 35% increase in the risk. There's a slight increase in the individual risk, but on a population level, that increases over time, and we will see increase in the incidence of breast cancer that is related to um, the fall in birth rate. Now, I wanted to highlight here that we do see a lot of women with breast cancer that is young, under the age of 50, who are still considered in the, in the reproductive um, age group. Now, a study that we had looked at, we had seen about 36% of all patients with breast cancer presented under the age of 50, and about 25% of them were under the age of 40. Again, this is not a trend that is unique to us. There are other populations around the world that is actually seeing the highest increase in breast cancer incidence in patients, in young patients under the age of 40. So we're also seeing this, and I wanted to highlight one of the implications here. So we just spoke about the decrease in um, birth rate, which may lead to an increase in breast cancer incidence. But also patients who have had a diagnosis of breast cancer, in particular that young girl that I was speaking about, after breast cancer diagnosis, the likelihood of having a child actually decreases significantly. 
that some of the treatments for breast cancer, including the chemotherapy, radiation therapy, et cetera, may have adverse effects on the patient's fertility afterwards. And what you'll find is that for women who have had breast cancer and who are still desirous of um, having children, the likelihood of having kids decreases significantly to about 40%. And for women between the ages of 40 and 50, it is even much lower than that. So not only does decrease in the birth rate increases the risk of breast cancer within the population, but actually the development of breast cancer also has a negative effect on fertility after a breast cancer diagnosis. So we actually have two things that we need to be looking at in the population, not just the decrease in um, crude birth rate and its relation to an increased risk of developing breast cancer in a population, but also on the individual basis where a breast cancer diagnosis decreases the risk of subsequent fertility. And that brings into the discussion um, things like fertility preservation in these young women. It's not something that we are having a lot of conversations about, but it's something that we should be mindful of because we will see a lot of young patients with breast cancer who are desirous of having children after their breast cancer treatment. And if that conversation is not had at the beginning, what you will find is that these women will lose their ability to have children if certain steps are not taken. So what can we do? Now, we cannot advise women that they should just start having children that they cannot afford. That would not be, that would not be responsible to do. So what we're saying is that we need to better understand the individual risk for each woman of developing breast cancer. We now need to take steps to modify these risks. And some of these things were mentioned by um, the previous uh, presenter when she spoke about lifestyle modifications. And that is something that is actually within our control. We can, and this is um, some recommendations that came from the World Health Organization, and I won't spend much time on them since they've already been mentioned. But these are the things on an individual basis and within the population that we can do that can actually decrease the risk of breast cancer. So no, the trends in decreasing um, birth rate, they are cultural, they are economically based, and these are not things that we expect to be reversed. So what we need to do is to look at the other risk factors for breast cancer and make the adjustments where we can. Also, everyone needs to understand our individual risk of developing breast cancer and get the appropriate screening recommendation that if she develops breast cancer, it can be diagnosed much earlier. So will the decline in birth rate lead to an increase in breast cancer? It's a complex discussion. Most of the data, most of what we are seeing is pointing to yes. However, there are things that we can do in a population level that can sort of offset this increase in breast cancer incidents um, relating to the decline in birth rate. Uh, so thank you very much um, for your attention and the opportunity to present on this topic. Thank you so much, Dr. Copeland. As one of our listeners said, very informative. Um, you know, you touched on a lot of points that none of us really would think about because this is not something that we really discuss in a public forum. And and I mean, especially you now with the declining birth rate and all of that, this is news to many, many people, including myself. Um, although I'm in the in the in the field or in the area of this discussion on a regular basis. This is not something that we dis discuss. I mean, usually with breast cancer or having had breast cancer, the normal conversation is, can I have children, doc? Or is it recommended to have children? If I do have, if I do get pregnant, will it be, you know, detrimental to my health? Those are the type of questions that we are having. So this is a very, very interesting topic. Lots of information. Please do not leave us because I know persons will have questions after we are finished. We just have, we have two more presenters and then we will go to 
the Q and A. Um, just once again, I just want to thank persons for joining our um, public forum. You know, brought to us by the Jamaica Cancer Society. I don't like the word free though. It's it's complimentary. Let's say it's complimentary because nothing in life is free. Everybody here has donated um, their time and their talent and all the information that they have had to put together. So really and truly, we are privileged to have this opportunity to hear all of this information and get an opportunity to ask questions when finished. Now, up next, we have Miss Patrice, Ms. Patrice Dyer, and she's a patient navigator. I know lots of us will not have heard those terms before. It is new to me because I am um, co have constant conversations with persons um, like my friend um, Stacian. So I and and I've been to a seminar with where where we fleshed out the whole patient navigator um, situation. Now we are going to let me just introduce Patrice. Patrice is a holistic, and uh, let me see if I get this word correctly, multipotentialite. Did I say that right? Multipotentialite. Multipotentialite. First time seeing that word. Author, communicator, co community builder, and life lover. She has been described by her clients as a transformation therapist. For over 19 years, she has accompanied and guided many persons, their families, and caregivers through various stages on their journey to healing and lifestyle transformation. Utilizing her skills as a complementary and alternative therapist, lymphedema therapist, certified professional, cancer coach, patient navigator, and death doula. Wow. She is passionate about promoting efficient quality care for all, in particular those living with and impacted by cancer and an advocate for palliative care. She reminds her clients that you are your greatest healthcare advocate, absolutely, and feels privileged to be able to offer support, to guide and empower individuals to actively take part in their own healing process and lives. Her insights and knowledge gained led her in 2020 to form Navigating Health Services Limited, a company focused on bridging the gap, creating pathways to quality healthcare. In 2021, the, she completed certification as a death doula and end of life planner. She is the author of It's Your Life, Care, Care Directive and Trans Transition Plan, a workbook and guide providing individuals with the necessary tools to not just make informed decisions about their health, but to act on them. In April, 2023, she has the distinct privilege of representing Jamaica as one of 12 persons from other countries who are featured in the hum Humboldt Forum mm -hmm. Museum in Berlin exhibit entitled Infinite Living with Death. She is forever Elsie's daughter, mother of Leila Harmony, an av avid reader, enjoys hiking, time with family and friends, exploring new places and embracing new ways to live life fully. Now, this is really very intriguing to me and I can't wait to listen, but I have some questions that I will um, pitch to you and so that you can inform our guests online about what is patient navigation. Well, thank you, Sandra, for all of that long introduction. <laughs> um, and I thank you to the Jamaica <clears throat> Cancer Society for inviting me, albeit it was a bit late, um, inviting me to come on this forum, but I'm, I'm grateful for the space to be able to share. So unlike our previous presenters, I don't have a slideshow 
to present tonight, but I feel like just speaking through some of the issues will be very helpful. And so um, let me speak to the question Sandra just posed for me, gave me basically what is patient navigation? So patient navigation or patient navigators are persons who support people to identify and then to find ways to remove barriers to accessing quality care. So a little bit of history, patient navigation actually started somewhere around in the 1990s um, in Harlem, New York. There was a doctor by the name of Dr. Harold Freeman, and he was kind of curious about why, um, in particular, uh, what we would call minorities, women of color and other persons in the Harlem community, why they were not accessing care, right? Some people would have gone for screening, but they didn't come back after getting results or they just weren't coming in to access the kind of care that they needed around, in particular, breast cancer care. And so he went into the community to kind of start talking to people and find out what was going on. And he utilized community members, um, persons in the medical field, social workers, a number of different people to come in and just kind of figure out what was happening. And what they discovered was there were some things that people weren't necessarily thinking about that were preventing people from coming into access care. One of those things there would be like some of the cultural barriers. Some people in the community spoke for example, Spanish spoke a different language or they um, didn't trust the system very well because they weren't familiar with a lot of things. There are some people who had children at home and they didn't have caregivers and they felt like, well, I can't come out and leave them to go and get treatment. Um, and then, of course, we know the financial issues because in Jamaica, that's something we hear about a lot, people struggling with financial issues. And so these people who he sent out into the community to talk to these individuals were referred to as patient navigators. So that's a little bit of history. And so what Dr. Freeman felt was that no person who was going through a diagnosis with cancer should have to, what he called, fight the system while going fighting the disease. And so navigators, our role is to really educate persons on um, where they are on their, on their disease process, educate with the support of their providers of care, or really reinforce some of the things that their providers of care have been speaking to them about. Um, our role is also to advocate for our clients, as well as to empower them, help them to increase their health literacy, among other things. So that's essentially what patient navigation is. You're on mute, Sandra. Mm -hmm. And what are some, thank you for that. What are some of the barriers to care that you have noticed? Well, here in Jamaica, it's been quite interesting as well. Um, because, you know, I, I, you look on the television, you see a lot of people coming forward seeking financial assistance. And actually, sometimes behind the scenes, I'll call, get contact information to talk to them about what's really happening. And sometimes it's communication gaps. That's a big thing. So that could be communication on the part of the patient themselves, not being able to, to effectively articulate what's happening with them to their providers of care, and also not understanding fully what the provider of care is explaining to them. So people will come and say, but the, the doctor didn't tell me that, or that didn't happen. But when you start to speak to them, you realize that, well, it's not that you weren't necessarily told, but maybe the time you were being told, so much was going on, you just heard you have cancer. Everything after that went blank, you didn't hear anything, right? And so um, that's one of the things I see. So I speak to people a lot about your support system, creating a support system and how you guide that support system. For example, going to appointments, especially hearing a diagnosis such as that, which is challenging for a number of people, it's good to have somebody with you, somebody who can listen to what is being said, and remind you or take notes or whatever it may be if you're not in a position to do so. And sometimes as navigators, we can fit into that role for some people, right? Sometimes part of the challenge is um, fear. There was a little bit of speaking to that earlier when we, you know, Dr. Cornwall and others were speaking about, you know, for example, going for screening. Um, that's one thing. But one big thing I see is just fear in general of the system, of being in the hospital, of, of speaking to providers, 
because maybe you're not feeling comfortable, you're not sure. And so fear is a big thing. Or you had a previous quote unquote bad experience in the system and that you feel like you're not gonna get treated the way you need to be treated. My family member had a history of something and you were afraid and so you didn't go and access care. So fear is something and lack of trust is another. They kind of go hand in hand in some ways. There are the cultural issues. We speak to myths around you know, conditions such as this. People have all kinds of ideas about how this works. And so that can also prevent them from accessing poor health literacy. We have a challenge in this country, even speaking to understanding where in our bodies we're feeling pain and discomfort. It's difficult sometimes to articulate it. I had a client saying to me, um, you know, miss, to tell the truth, I'm not that smart. That was how that person put it. Um, I don't really know how to ask for these things. I don't know what to ask. And so my thing was, it doesn't matter where you are from, your level of education, there's a way to break this down for you to understand. Sometimes, unfortunately, especially in our public health system, there might not be enough time to sit down and break down this type of information for somebody, right? And so um, my encouragement is keep a copy of your records, keep a copy of things that we can talk through some of the things and tell me what you understand first. Let me hear what you understand and we can move from there. But there is a way to break it down for people to understand. And so if they feel like they're not understanding, they're less likely to ask questions as well, which is another thing. So sometimes people say, but I didn't know what to ask. I don't understand. And so one of the things I do is support them with just questions. Here are some questions you can go in and ask so you can get more clarity on your diagnosis, right? So that's another thing. Denial is a big thing. So we speak to screening. I, in fact, see quite a number of people who have been screened. They know their diagnosis and they're not doing anything about it. Yeah. Yep. So it's not that they don't have the access. And these are people across the board, different levels of society who have chosen to sit with it and do nothing. That's a big thing. So my thing is, why are you doing nothing? And sometimes you get some very interesting responses about why the choice is to do nothing. So there is that. Um, the long wait in our public health system, it's a challenge. It's a big challenge to accessing quality care along the way. So those are some of the main ones. And of course, the financial issues. We all know them. We all hear people talk about the cost of treatment, the cost of doing tests, um, and the cost of food and just the general challenges. If you're having challenges and you need to go to work and you're not feeling well enough to go to work, that could present some challenges for your overall family. I speak to cancer itself as a more of a holistic type disease. It's impacting so many different areas of your life. And we often just focus on the physical, right? But as we mentioned earlier, your mental health is critical. I don't think enough people are, are accessing that kind of support and care. And I don't think it's necessarily pushed enough. You know, people are not necessarily encouraged in the beginning to start with accessing that care at the very beginning as well, because that is key. So some of, those are some of the main things that I see people come to me um, with in terms of barriers to care. Okay. Um, the WHO, the, the World Health Organization Global Cancer Initiative theme, which is no one should face breast cancer alone. How does patient navigation relate to this? Well, that's interesting. You know, I was very pleased this year to see the World Health Organization step up and speak to patient navigation and how it can support um, what we're discussing tonight, early detection, screening, and just general um, overall support for accessing treatment and, and care. And so just yesterday, they had a, a wonderful webinar speaking to many people around the world who've been through journeys and who are acting as navigators um, and, you know, also doctors and others speaking to how navigation has been supporting their entire program for breast cancer care in the various countries. And so it's something here that I think it's important for us to, to take note of as well. When we say no one should face breast cancer alone, I mean, just now Dr. Copeland spoke to the fact that we are seeing more people, more women and, and some men being diagnosed here with more aggressive disease, um, also later stages. And I see a lot of that. 
And so, you know, earlier you, when you were introducing me, you spoke to palliative care and spoke to me being a death doula, which is something people don't understand much about as well. That's uh, well, like a too program much all by it. itself. That's a whole program by itself. <laughs> but in essence, I do see a lot of people who are facing a serious diagnosis and have to be facing serious challenges, you know, making decisions about what to do next and how to show up in life, walking with this, feeling like I'm living with death or living with, you know, um, to face it, facing these serious issues. And so we have to speak to that. And I don't think sometimes based on my feedback from a lot of these individuals I've worked with that they feel comfortable, especially in this month to speak about their experience, right? Um, World Health Organization is using a term now, which I like, uh, and I've just kind of, put it as a PWLE, a person with lived experience, is a, is a term they're choosing to use for people who are going through the journey with breast cancer across the continuum of care. So we have people who are showing up early, some are not, they're at different stages, but everybody is entitled to care and support. Nobody should be alone. There are a lot of people who are unfortunately alone no family member or friends, or they're choosing to be alone. Because in this country, we talk about cultural barriers. One of them is, I speak to people about secrecy versus privacy. We have a culture of secrecy that people will live in a house with others and not tell them about their diagnosis, including husbands and wives. It's a big thing. And it's something we need to speak to families will know someone is sick and will not share what is wrong with that particular individual. And so it's hard to embrace support and access care if we don't even want to acknowledge that something is happening with us. So those are big issues that I think need a little bit more highlighting throughout this period as well. And so I'm thankful for the space just to at least bring it to the table. Now, what is unique to us as well, which nobody, which people rarely mention, is that you do have sectors of the society that do believe in obia and do believe in that it's a family curse and all of that, which is another reason why some of them don't speak about it. But that's another program again, all by itself. What are the recommend? What are your recommendations to optimize the navigation services in Jamaica? Well, I think, first of all, we have to improve how we communicate. Um, so, for example, you know, we have forums like, like this, which are important. And as a navigator, one of the things for me is how can I get information across to people that's more accessible? When I say accessible, language that's used is important. So we will use, you know, a lot of medical uh, jargon and stuff for, for a lot of people that just don't understand. And they're not going to say, I don't understand. That's another cultural thing we have here. We often think asking questions makes us look stupid. So we don't ask them. So you're sitting there listening to a whole presentation and you have no clue fully what was being said. That's gonna be difficult to reach people if they can't understand the language that's being used. So we need to create more spaces that have conversation that's bringing it to the level of everybody. That's one thing. And more spaces year round to speak to these issues. It's great to have this month and have these conversations, but definitely I think we need more public forum around the year that will encourage more conversations like this. Um, we definitely need some navigators across different um, places and stages and, and, and different professions. So yes, you have lay navigators, you have navigators who I call cancer resource specialists who are persons like yourself, Sandra, who've been through a journey. And because you've been through the journey, you can speak personally to it and may be able to speak personally to some of the things in the, in the healthcare system that can support somebody else to move through a little more quickly or have more understanding. We need social workers who can show up as navigators to see what some of the issues are in households that may be preventing people from accessing care, financial planners, people like them who can take you through your finances and your insurance and things like that and be able to give you guidance as to um, how you can best plan when you are facing situations like this. Um, so there's so many different ways that we can show up, but those are some of the things I think that can be supportive um, just in the short run. And, and 
for doctors also who may be feeling pressure because the workload is great with what we're having happening here. You know, you can also encourage people to go and speak to persons like myself to just kind of get a little more understanding about next steps and questions. So when they come in, they can just fire and say, that these are the things I'm concerned about. Um, what, what is my treatment plan? What do I need to do? Tell me more about my condition. You know, they can, they can come with more direct questions that, you know, can help to improve the communication in their consultancy period, you know? So right. just different things like that. Okay, and, and, and how can we streamline communication between patients and healthcare providers? <laughs> That's a very good one. How you streamline it? I don't understand that one. But, but you know, the thing about communication. I guess more. You probably want to say, how can we encourage it? Then I mean, you know, more than as you said, people don't really ask questions. You know, so how can we make it routine or you know? Because I've 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 been through breast cancer for twenty five years. I'm the president of Jamaica Reach to Recovery, and if it were not for Stacy and I would not have met you nobody has ever recommended that i see you i have never heard of you so at what point that's my other question to follow up this question is at what who would who would introduce me to you well that's interesting most people who meet me interestingly enough meet me through others right other people refer there are some doctors as well but i get a lot of referrals for lymphedema right and that's an opening for me that is an opening for me to, to have conversation with people about, hey, what's going on with you? So I usually, you know, talk to them about who I am and the various things that I do, especially if I see them showing up with certain challenges, right? So that's one thing. Um, you know, to this year in particular, I'm hosting a forum on navigating cancer in the Jamaican workplace coming up next week. And so things like that, you know, just open the space for more awareness for people. I have a program called Moving Beyond Pink. It's been around for four years now. Um, and that's our breast navigation program. And in that program, you know, we have online things that we've produced over the years. We've had webinars. We've even invited members of Reach to Recovery um, to speak. Mrs. Graham was on one of our programs called Breast Cancer Conversations year before last. And so we've been doing a little, few little things, you know, just to get the word out. My focus has not really been on promotion in that way, but mainly on just getting some valuable information or creating spaces for people to be able to show up and feel comfortable to speak and learn how to advocate for themselves. Another important, well, last question for you, but very important because we have 3.5 million people in Jamaica. How many of you are there? Are there? Well, that I know for sure, trained. <laughs> Uh, actually, you have two members in your group who, who have been trained. Okay. Um, and so they will identify themselves. I won't blow them up on the screen. <laughs> um, I've trained about eight or nine people. Um, and then including them, I'd say 10 people in general that I know about for sure. Not actively necessarily practicing, but the aim is to increase that. In particular, I want to increase that in the space of, of persons with lived experience, persons who've gone through the journey, because I believe that they can be really, really supportive. Um, people like myself can create spaces for people to share what I call from a space of empowerment, having gone through an experience, figuring out how you want to share, why you want to share, what's important about your journey that you want to share, and not just blank blanketly opening yourself up to sharing and not necessarily feeling comfortable, but that's something that I see a lot too. Um, so in the share, meaningful share, it's a very good way also of reaching people and letting them understand the journey. Well, boy, I'm telling you that this session for me was an eye opener. I mean, I've never had a conversation with a navigator before. And this is, I'm sure our online um, viewers, I'm sure also learned a lot in that very, in that conversation, because it is very, it will be very helpful for persons going through, because we are just, we are one group and we're not in all of, in Jamaica. 
We are based mainly in Kingston. And so somebody like you would be really truly beneficial to someone who is about to go on their journey or even going through the journey. So I am really, really, really very appreciative of you coming on. And I please send me those flyers of those webinars that are about to, to, to come up so that I can share um, with, on my page and our page on Jamaica Reach to Recovery page. And I'm sure Jamaica Cancer Society will also help to share the, your information so that more persons can benefit from what it is that you do. So thank you so, so much, uh, Ms. Dwyer. I, um, I want to say, um, I, can't, I can't even explain how happy I am to have met you. So thank you so much. Have a good evening. And please do not leave because we will have one more person and we will <clears throat> then take Q&A for all the persons. <clears throat> thank you so much okay, okay thank you. so we're so our final presenter will be dr sabrina palomino she is a dietitian and um just to tell you a little bit more about her sabrina palomino is a distinguished regional dietitian for the southeast regional health authority where her expertise shapes nutritional standards and practices. Holding a Bachelor of Science in Dietetics and Nutrition from UTEC and a Master's in Food and Agroprocessing from UWI, Mona, she combines academic rigor with practical experience. With over 15 years in the field, Sabrina excels as a consultant dietitian and director of diet dietitian corner jamaica where she specializes in ketogenetic diet management for diverse populations including individuals with specific health conditions athletes and fam families seeking healthier lifestyles now what i like particularly about this forum is that we deal with two two sections of survival which many of us don't really talk about. Talk about talk about medication, we talk about treatment, but most we don't talk about the mental health part and we don't talk about the diet part. So I am so happy for these two presenters that we can hear more about, you know, what we should be eating, when, the where, the how, you know, how do we select our foods, that kind of thing. So over to you, Dr. Palomino. So happy to have you. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. So I'm just going to give a brief overview of nutrition and breast cancer and the role that it plays. And of course, at the end, we'll have the answer, question and answer sections that I will delve a little bit more. So what role does nutrition play in breast cancer awareness? So it's very important that we have a well-balanced diet because this can help to reduce the risk of developing breast cancer and help to the support of your overall health during and after treatment. So there's no specific diet or food out there that is going to be superior in terms of preventing you from developing breast cancer. But what nutrition does it that it helps to reduce your risk. And there are certain foods that are shown to have health benefits, such as your fruits and your vegetables, Right, because they give us what is known as antioxidants and fibers. And of course, we encourage you to choose healthier fats. And when you do consume your proteins, you we do encourage you to consume your lean proteins. Or of course, you can use your plant-based protein. So what is important when it comes to nutrition is that research is showing that if you're overweight or obese, you're at an increased risk of developing breast cancer, especially in our postmenopausal women. So what we do encourage you to do is try to maintain a healthy way to balance that and, of course, your regular physical activity because this can help to reduce your risk. What does eating a balanced diet mean? Basically, what it is, we want you to have a diet that is rich in fruits and vegetables. And I always encourage persons to think local, think seasonal, because we assume that healthy eating is expensive and as such, it might be a deterrent. 
for us to eat healthy. So one of the ways that you can eat healthy within a budget or on a budget is to, of course, choose seasonal items. If they're in season, they're cheaper. And I always encourage persons to think local because we have been so tailored in terms of when we, if we type in healthy eating, the first things that probably pop up on our screen is maybe cauliflower broccolis that are very, very expensive. When you can get similar nutrients from local, locally available vegetables like your kalaloo or your pap choy, which the prices are relatively cheaper compared to those high, high end fruits and vegetables. So you think local, you think seasonal. And of course, whole grains, they're good sources of fiber. They have overall good nutrition. And of course, you must have protein in your diet because you're going through a stressful period, especially when you start your various type of therapies. And as such, you'll start to lose weight. Some persons might start to lose weight. They might have decreasing appetite. So you do need your protein to help to repair and build back your muscles. And of course, your lean protein, they provide essential nutrients as well as an antioxidants, such as our vitamins A, our vitamin C. And these will all help to protect your cells from damage and reduces your risk of developing certain types of cancers. We also ask you to reduce or limit your alcohol consumption because that is shown to as well to increase your risk for breast cancer. So if you choose to drink al alcohol, we do advise that you do so in moderation, but it's best to avoid it altogether. And of course, we do encourage you to reduce processed foods and sugars. So high intake of your processed foods, that these would include like your red meat, such as your sausages, your frankfurters, those kind of things, they are shown to have things that are linked to developing certain types of cancers. So we do encourage you to reduce your intake of processed foods and, of course, reduce your intake of sugary foods because excess sugar, although there's no direct link to show that excess sugar can lead to cancer, what it does is that because when you consume excess sugar, it contributes to obesity because it will allow you to gain weight and you once you're obese, you're at increased risk of reducing cancer. Of, sorry, at increased risk of developing cancer. And as such, we ask you to reduce your intakes of excessive sugars. So we always say stick to your recommendation, 60 spoon for women per day, 90 spoon for men. And as always, moderation is very, very important when we eat. We want you to include healthy fats. Fats are important in our diet. They're a good source of energy, especially when we start to lose weight or we start to have taste aversions. Fats will help in terms of meeting our calorie needs. And we encourage you to eat healthy fats. So you include more of your nuts, your seeds, your avocados, and of course, what we call fatty fish, like your salmon, your tunas, your sardines. They're good sources of omega-3 fatty acids. They're known to help to build our immune system. And of course, they have anti-inflammatory properties that are very, very beneficial for us when we are diagnosed or even going through some amount of therapy. We want you to maintain a high fiber diet too as well. And your fibers, of course, you get it from your whole grains, which is include your brown provisions, your brown bread, your brown rice, your legumes, your fruits and vegetables. And these all can help with weight management and they also promote digestive health. They're good for gut. We know how gut health is very, very important in terms of our overall management. And high fiber also helps with constipation if that is something that you might be experiencing as well. So during your breast cancer treatment is very, very important. You try to maintain proper nutrition to support your immune system and your overall health. There is no one fit all for everybody. Everybody is an individual. Persons will go through different symptoms. And as such, we do seek you, ask you to seek out your healthcare provider, seek out your dietitians and your nutritionists for support in terms of what to eat or how to manage your nutrition-related symptoms such as dry mouth, weight loss, nausea, vomiting. And of course, as we said, some treatments that might lead to the nausea and the appetite, always seek out your assistance from your dietitian. So what do we want you to do? Protein is important. It is crucial for tissue repair and immune function. So we encourage you to ensure that you get enough lean protein in your diet. And sources would include your poultry, your fish. And if you decide to go plant-based, you can always have your to tofu or your legumes because those are good sources of protein as well. It's very important that we stay hydrated, especially if you start to experience side effects like diarrhea or vomiting from certain treatments. So it's very important that you stay hydrated. And when it comes to supplementation, some persons might not be able to eat. They might have a decrease in appetite. 
and supplements might play a role. So some of our liquid food or some of our supplementations are things that they can have. And it depends on what is happening. And before you take any supplementation, we always encourage that you speak to your healthcare provider so they can give you a guide as in if this is an appropriate supplement that you can use. And always, always speak to them before you undertake any supplements at all. There is no specific diet, right? Whether it's low, low fat, plant based, there's no specific diet that, that is going to help. What we do encourage that you do is that you try to eat healthy. Try to include a variety of food from all your six food groups. Try to focus more on your fruits, your vegetables, your whole grains, your leaner proteins, and of course, your healthy fats. And we cannot stress the importance of trying to maintain a healthy weight. And if you, if there's weight loss or weight increased due to any issue during treatment, always speak to your dietitian or your nutritionist as they can assist you into prop, how to properly manage any one of these conditions. So in conclusion, before we go into our questions and answer, always important to increase your fruits, your veggies, and your grains. We always say about four to five cups of fruits and vegetables per day. What does that mean in layman terms? Two to three whole fruits per day. And of course, as much green leafy vegetables as you can afford or cooked vegetables, you try to increase your vegetables. And of course, we want you to increase your protein. You need them to build your muscles. And of course, your fluids are very important. And we might experience some taste aversions where we don't taste certain things. You might have a metallic taste in our mouth. We encourage you to use your natural herbs and spices to flavor your so that way eating can be something that's so, enjoyable. And of course, once it's enjoyable, you're going to eat more. And that's what we want to do because we want you to maintain nutrition during and after your diagnosis. All right, thank you. Thank you, Doc. That was very um, comprehensive and <clears throat> very informative. So we are is we are now at the Q and A time for all our presenters. So uh, for those persons who missed the earlier persons, we had Dr. Daria Cornwall. We also had Dr. Pernell Bell. We had Dr. Jason Copeland, Patrice Dial, and now you just heard Dr. Sabrina Palomino. Now, for those who missed the earlier presenters, please note that it was uh, it is taped and it will be available on Jamaica Cancer Society's page. As well, it, it was it is being streamed live. Thanks for, to um, Joan Andrea Hutchinson on PBCJ and uh, that's we are really appreciative for that because that we um we reaches a very wide audience and so at this time please we mute muted again sorry we we <laughs> I'm asking that you, when you, when you want to ask a question, did you hear me thank PBCJ to say we're streaming live? Did you hear that part? Yes, we did. Okay. So, all right. So now we are going into the Q&A section. We are asking that persons who would like to ask a question, because I'm sure after all these presentations, and there are persons online that would like to ask burning questions that they have not had the opportunity to ask these experts. But you're going to, um, there's a raise your hand feature in the chat, I believe, that you would raise your hand and then we'll take your questions. Um, anyone? Any questions for any of the presenters? Just realized that my camera wasn't so <laughs> Okay. You would like to ask a question? Oh, you're just realizing no, Doc. Okay. <laughs> I just realized it's you. 
Okay, nice to see you. Nice to meet you. Now I can greet you when I see you in public. <laughs> Anybody has any questions? Reactions. You go in the reaction section. I believe there's a hand raise. You just click on the hand raise for persons who would like to ask questions. Nobody? Everybody's shy? Okay, so let me ask the first question. Pardon me, Mr. All right, so I would ask is there one? The, I will ask the first question. Okay. Go I ahead. would like to ask all presenters to kindly turn on your cameras. Okay. <laughs> That's not a question. That's not a question. That's a statement. <laughs> okay, so how much does a mammogram at JCS cost with a health card? Or do you use a health card at Jamaica Cancer Society? I guess that one would be for Julian. Julia? I'm not hearing you. I wasn't being allowed by the host to unmute my <laughs> mic. <laughs> so I'm saying that the cost of a mammogram at the Cancer Society is $6,000. And the cost with insurance depends on what your particular insurance plan would cover. So it wouldn't be across the board for the cost. But it shouldn't exceed, I think, $1,200. But it depends on the card that you have, the plan that you have, and that should dictate what it is for $6,000. All right. So, oh, thank you. Welcome. What, what, what I'd like to ask is um, Dr. Palomino, because I'm a, I'm a meat eater doc. I, I, it's a struggle doc. I know a lot of persons... You know, they talk about, you know, going vegan. Should you eat meat? Should you eat red meat? You know, that is the biggest um, question being asked out there. You know, having had cancer, you know, do I need to change my diet radically? You know, only peas and beans and veggies. And, you know, you cut this and you cut that. Well, sugars, I know they say sugars is not your friend, right? Sugars are not your friend. But can you shed a little light on the meat situation? For me. <laughs> All right. So your body needs protein, right? And that's a new trend that you mainly get from your meat. You do get protein from your plant based too as well. So what the research is showing is that it's mainly what we call your processed meat that might have some chemicals that put you at risk. So it's usually your processed meat that we ask you to eliminate from your diet. So like your maybe your sausages, your bologna, your deli meat, anything that has been processed. You try to reduce, or if you can eliminate that from your diet, that would be good too as well. And you try to have lean protein because your body needs protein for repair, especially when you start to go through your treatments. You do need protein to repair those muscles and to repair those tissues. So you try to have your lean protein. So you can have it from your poultry, you can have it from your fish. And of course, you can use your plant base, your peas and beans as a source. So it's not that it you have to go towards plant based right? Because not all persons will gravitate towards that lifestyle change. I mean, a plant-based will have, of course, it's have anti-inflammatory factors. You're going to get your vitamins, you're going to get your minerals, plus your fiber and your protein. So it's good to incorporate a little bit more plant-based when you're diagnosed, so that way you get additional nutrients. But it is not really and truly nothing showing that you have to go strictly plant-based but you can always include some amount of animal protein, but we encourage you to reduce the processed meats, have more of the leaner ones. And of course, moderation is always important. And of course, I cannot overemphasize, always consult your nutritionist or your dietitian because there's not a one size that fits all. We're all individual, right? So we have different nutritional needs. So you always seek out your professional and they can help you in terms of managing and directing you in terms of how to eat properly you know, depending on what is happening. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Lorna is asking. Sorry, uh, we also have, Ms. Samuels, beg your pardon. Yes. We also have a hand up. Um, okay. Ms. James. So which one Which one should we take first? Because Lorna had asked, I mean, before I saw the hand, she asked in the chat. Should we, I'm going to take Lorna first and then I go to Joni. Is that Okay. 
Oh, yes, that's right. Okay, all right. So, Lorna, okay, so good. She says, good night. I would like to ask, how likely is someone who is diagnosed with fibrocystic disease, fibrocystic breast, to develop breast cancer? Um, Dr. Cornwall, you want to take that? She's muted. Dr. Cornwall? Dr. Cornwall? You're muted. I just thought the host had me <laughs> unable to. <laughs> I can, okay. Um, just no, I did I hear link directly with fibrocystic disease does not increase the risk of breast um, what increases your risk in terms of breast composition is if you have a lot of glands that make milk. So women who hear that their breast is dense, that is an independent risk factor for breast cancer. So women's breasts can have lots of glands and a little bit of glands, as I showed in my image before. So the more glands you have in your breast, the whiter the breast looks on the mammogram. And um, women who have more glands, we say their breast is dense. And we do know that having dense breasts increases the risk for getting breast cancer, meaning having more glands that may milk in the breast. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have more fibrocystic changes. So there's not a direct link between fibrocystic changes and breast cancer, as there is a link between having more glands or more breast, more glands that may milk or having dense breasts. Um, that is what tends to increase the risk for getting breast cancer in terms of breast composition. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Joni, your time. Joni, James. You have been given permission to unmute okay. me. Yes, you have been given permission Un to unmute. Just unmute, Joni. Just click the notice that appeared on your on your screen, please. Oh, oh, I can, okay. I can oh I can unmute her. No, no, no. That's for Joni. Oh, she unmute. must unmute. Right. So she got a message, and so she needs to just click it. Joni, please do unmute your 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 mic. All right. She's not. I don't know. She's not hearing me. All right, what, there was a question until she sorts out her mic. Uh, says, what happened if a lady is diagnosed with breast cancer and is pregnant? I had a Dr. Copeland or a doctor. Cornwall, Dr. Corn Dr. Copeland, would you like to take that? So let me just take, let me just first, I like that, I'm glad that the term um, pregnancy came up because I want to make it clear. I mean, and, and, and I'm glad that that question about pregnancy because what is the recommendation now? I'm going back to screening. Being pregnant should not prevent a woman from doing her screening mammogram if she's of the age to, to do her mammogram. So a woman who, if she's of increased risk, having family history of breast cancer or any increased factors that make her have to start from the age of 30, if that woman gets pregnant, she should be able to do her screening mammogram as if she were not pregnant because the dose of radiation is very also, if that woman is over 40, she should be doing her screening mammogram just the same. So, in other words, what I'm saying is being pregnant should not prevent a woman from being able to do her mammogram um, <clears throat> if she fits the age to be doing a mammogram, right? Okay. So that's the first thing. <laughs> the next thing is that if a woman is pregnant, the same protocol will exist. We go through, we do the mammogram, <clears throat> we do the biopsy, we do the receptor testing and all of that. And it depends on the stage at which she is pregnant and the type of breast cancer that she has and all of that. We have patients right now at University Hospital. I have a patient who was just 
diagnosed, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. She had a chemotherapy and then she had a baby. She had a surgery and everything and she has a baby. And she, this is about a year ago. Um, and um, she's doing quite fine. But breast cancer is very heterogeneous. No two breast cancers are alike, so we cannot give a blanket statement. Right. So each patient will have to be taken on an individual basis. Individual basis. As a matter of fact, each breast, each bre breast cancer, everybody's cancer, breast cancer is so heterogeneous, meaning that my uh, Mary Jane's breast cancer may be different to John to 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 to, to Mary Joan, or so. So each kind of patient with breast cancer's outcome depends on the type of cancer they have and the stage at which we form their cancer. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Palomina again, should a lady change her diet once diagnosed with breast cancer? So it depends on what your current diet is. For example, if you are currently eating a diet that might be you know, very high in maybe processed foods, that kind of thing, simple sugars, we would encourage you to change it and try to adapt a more healthy, balanced diet. So that's the only thing that would ask you to change in terms of your diet. And of course, you have to look at the possible side effect that you might experience during treatment. Then that too would tailor you to, part, to a particular or a specific diet. So, you know, it depends on what is happening. So we have to look at the person as a whole to see what is happening and not you know, broad brush anything because, you know, everybody has a different experience. Well, if, as I said before, if you're consuming what we would traditionally call the Western diet that is high in, in saturated fats, you know, it's high in simple sugars, it's high in processed foods, we'd ask you to change that type of diet and try to adapt to more what we call an anti-inflammatory diet, which is a diet that is rich in your fruits, your vegetables, your whole grains, your lean meats, and of course your healthy fats. Okay. Thank you, Doc. What, um, what is the cost of an ultrasound at Cancer Society? Well, I know that Cancer Society does not offer ultrasound, but um, Dr. Cornwall can you, or, or Dr. Copeland, can you give me a ballpark figure what an ultrasound normally co um, costs? Anybody? So an ultrasound could cost, it depends. The cost of, rate of, of of these services is very heterogeneous in Jamaica, but the price can make anything from maybe 6000 or so up to about 20000 15000 He says, he says, he said, he said, he said, he said, he said, he Okay, thank you so much. Chemotherapy doesn't affect chemotherapy doesn't affect birth. Does a lady uh that has low blood count, but chemotherapy doesn't affect birth. Does a lady who has a low blood count with chemotherapy? I suppose she's asking if it will affect. What is the effects? I believe. Maybe that's what she's asking. Oh. I'm not quite understanding the question, but she's asking about chemotherapy during after birth. Now, does chemotherapy, chemotherapy doesn't affect birth. Does a lady... With a low blood count, I think you need to rephrase that question, please. I'm not. She I'm did. not sure she what did. you're she asking. Did. She did. Okay. All right. And what is the recommended age for a mammogram, please? So, if a woman does not have any history of cancer in their family, then the risk factor for that woman getting breast cancer is just her age. Being a woman and getting in their family start their mammogram at the age of 40 
And remember that you don't need a paper from a doctor to do the mammogram once. In, in, in Jamaica, in Trinidad and Tobago and other countries, for example, you may need a paper to do your mammogram. But in Jamaica, once you've reached 40, 35, 40, you don't need a paper from a doctor to do your mammogram. Just like you could do your pap smear without a paper, you could do your mammogram without a paper. Now, if you have cancer in your family, like if you have the breast cancer genes in your family, like the Angelina Jolie's with a breast cancer, one other breast cancer, two genes in your family, you yourself don't even have to test for the genes. You are almost guaranteed that it's just time before you can get breast cancer. So women who have the genes for breast cancer in their family start their mammogram at the age of 30. And sometimes we may have to start as early as 25. But the women who start at 40 are the women who don't have cancer in their family and is only doing it because their age becomes the risk factor for cancer. And I say to women, the teeth of cancer doesn't go to everybody's house, but only the teeth know who house it going. So everybody have to check their house. If no cancer is coming, we won't find no teeth. If cancer is there, we catch it early and kick it out and lock the door and throw away the key. Mm. Absolutely. Can, Can you I... get pregnant? Go ahead. Yeah, I was, sorry, I just wanted to jump in with what Dr. Cornwell just said a while ago to ask you, Dr. Cornwell, because there are a number of young women who complain about going and asking early and being told no. Yeah, um, how, how, what, what would you recommend for those young ladies, especially if they have a history of breast cancer in terms of what do you recommend they tell their doctors who tell them no about accessing mammography early. Okay. You're mute. Muted. Muted. Okay, so I'm okay. So you're breaking up. Woman. You're breaking up. Am I breaking up still? Yes. A little bit. Start better. again. Start again. Okay, so we encourage all women. So there's a difference between being over 40 and being under 40. Let me just explain it. All women, teenage girls, my youngest patient with breast cancer is 17. She did six form exam. She did her exams with one breast. We encourage all women, teenage girls coming up, 20s, 30s, all age groups to do their breast examination every month. If you feel any change in your breast, do not ignore it. Whatever your age, 15, 16, 20, 25, 30, whatever it, do not ignore any change in your breast. Right? Now, when you've reached the age of 30, we advise that all women to go to their doctor for a risk assessment to see if you are of the age who should start, if you're of the risk that should start your mammogram at 30, or if you could wait until 40, 35, 40. And, and your doctor doing the risk assessment will say, okay, you have, to, you have your risk profile, you can wait until 35, 40 to start your mammogram. If the risk profile is increased, then you start at 30. Now, that said, so the Women who have had breast cancer in their family or ovarian cancer in their family, or even like pancreatic cancer and prostate cancer, there are different profiles that would make us you have increased risk to have to start your mammogram at age 30. If you are not of that, then you may wait until 35, 40. The problem now is that the women who are under 40 or under 30, the women who cannot of the age are not of the age to their mammogram have to rely on feeling a lump or feeling some change. While the women who are of the age to start their mammogram, even if the breast feels normal, they have to take the breast on an outing to get a mammogram to make sure the breast is normal for truth. So that leaves now women who don't have, they, who are not from cancer family, under 40 and 35. They were the ones who would have to be relying on feeling a lump or something to get some tests done. That's a dilemma because we, I have patients 28, as a matter of fact, I recently had a 28, a 29, and a 30-year-old, all who had breast cancer, and it's only the one who was 29 had cancer in her family. So she knew that she was of an increased risk profile. What happens to the 28-year-old who does not have cancer in her family? Um, can she just 
turn up without any feelings of anything in the breast to get checked. They can go get their, their doctor's examination, but for a woman who is of 28 or 30 or 29 who don't have any cancer in their family, the unfortunate thing is that they would have to feel something like a lump or something before they get checked. Because there isn't a protocol that says that a woman who is 28 should just go and get a mammogram even though the breast feels normal. Yes, right? yeah. It's a statistical challenge. Because statistics says that getting if you don't have cancer in your family, your risk increases with age. So the younger woman who does not have cancer in her family would have to rely on feeling the breast every month. And if they feel something, then go and get it checked. And if a woman who is younger have any, any anything in the breast that makes us feel that she needs to do a mammogram, we do mammogram on 28-year-olds. We do mammogram on 25-year-olds. Depends on the scenario. But it's just that okay. they would have to feel something happening to go and get that check. Okay. While when you reach 35, 40, even if your breasts feel normal and on top of the world, looking down on creation, you still take the normal breast on an outing to get it checked. So we tend to find those the people who are of mammogram age, their cancers could be caught earlier than the ones who are not of mammogram age. Okay. So, all right. Can you get pregnant after diagnosis of breast cancer and treatment? I, I can now unmute. Yes. We have ladies, we harvest their eggs put them away and give them their cancer treatment and then they can get pregnant. And that is something we need to have in the conversation with younger women because we are really finding much more younger women with breast cancer now for many reasons. And then we also know that our black population, we get more aggressive cancers at earlier age and our Caucasian based counterpart of the same age group. So what one of the things that is a conversation in, in, in breast cancer management is for younger ladies or women of childbearing age is to discuss with the doctor because um, there, there are techniques to freeze the eggs or to, to, to have the eggs harvested and put away, get their treatment, and then they can get pregnant. But that is a conversation. It won't happen automatically. That's a conversation to have with a service provider um, if a woman who is of childbearing age is pregnant. And of course, the earlier we find the cancer, it's also better because it gives better treatment options that will help to preserve fertility as well. But Does one, chemotherapy affect birth? It can, it can affect birth. Well, so if a woman is pregnant and needs chemotherapy, we, we the, the, the choice of the chemotherapy and all the, the factors must be tailored to that woman. And what medication is given to them and all of that would be tailored. But as I told you, we have patients who... I've recently had a patient who was diagnosed with breast cancer. I saw her, she was about four months pregnant, diagnosed, she got her chemo and everything because she had to have new treatment before the surgery. And she had all her as a bouncing baby. Does chemotherapy so it affect depends your... on a number? Does chemotherapy, chemotherapy affect, affect your blood count? Yes, or, it does. No, does it affect your blood count? also red blood cells and white it can affect blood count and anybody who is on chemotherapy would notice that they are doing blood tests because the hematologist and the oncologist will be checking the blood counts to see if they are being affected and would monitor and alter the treatment or um um, journey to suit the blood count. Sometimes they may ease off of the chemotherapy, let them build up back and stuff. So that is some a blood count is always monitored for women on chemotherapy, whether pregnant or not, regardless of age or not. Every woman who is getting chemotherapy, their blood count will be monitored rigorously by the physician. Okay, last couple of questions. So, does Cancer Society has payment plan for mammogram if patient is without insurance? Surely, and that's yours. I thought this was well known. We do, as well as we do give away mammograms as long as we have free mammograms to give away. So, uh, we yeah. have two. We have two to give away Tonight. online. Yes. So um, I'll just select the first person, and that, that asked a question, which was Lorna, and I will now select the last person. And who asked quite a few questions, Christine Brown Tal Talbert. So you you both are gifted with two free mammograms. 
so you can call the um cancer society how, how are they going to receive these um vouchers julian julian Sandra, I'm just always muted and it keeps oh. uh, muting, muting, muting. Right, so Christine and Lorna, Lorna G. Is email me at fundraising at jcs.live and I will respond to them and they can pick up their gift certificates. Oh, great. So we, we have come to the end. and But before we go, I mean, I can't leave without plugging my Jamaica doll with as you know, I'm the president of Jamaica Reach to Recovery, and I have to invite everyone online to, you know, join us for our major fundraiser, which is next week, Sunday. Oh, sorry, this is the Jamaica Reach to Recovery, ICWI Pink Run, which will be at Emancipation Park. And <coughs> excuse me, for those of you who don't know who and what we, we do and who we are, Jamaica Reach to Recovery is a breast cancer support group, and we are about 130 plus strong. We meet every second Tuesday of the month at Webster's Memorial Church Hall, and we support women going through breast cancer. We also offer financial assistance up to $100,000, which can be used for mammograms, ultrasound, needle biopsy, minor ops, medication, uh, screening of whatever kind, um, as long as it has to do with breast cancer. And how do you get in touch with us? You call Secretariat at 876-978-0375, or we are on the same building as the Jamaica Cancer Society, we're downstairs to your left, and we are, which is the breast form that you use in case you did not do a uh, reconstruction. We sell special bras, we sell gym wear, and we also sell swimwear because we believe that although a woman has had, fabulous I am, you don't expect me to just go away and you know slide away in the in the in the in the in the corner so of course we live our normal natural lives so we go to the gym we go swimming and because we are one breasted or maybe no breast at all if you have if you cannot afford or have not done reconstruction we sell what is called prosthesis which are beautiful breast forms looks like a breast feels like a breast the bras are beautiful and sexy and really attractive and the bath suits are not for the dirty they are nice regular swimsuits however you have the pockets where you had to ad uh, um, advertise and do a little plug for jamaica reach to recovery as well as please come out and support the run because this is our only fundraiser we are we are a registered charity organization and we we do not give the money directly to the individual, whomever, we, um, whatever you are doing. So if it's a doctor, we pay the doctor. If it's a pharmacist, we pay the pharmacist, so forth and so forth. If you are doing scans, wherever you're going, we pay for up to the tune of $100,000. So if you want to reach out to us, we have a website. We have two websites, actually. JA reach to record at um, dot com as well as uh, pinkrunjm.com. Now, Jamaica Cancer Society, um, they have um, mammograms all year round, not just in October, all year round. You can go to the Jamaica Cancer Society, mammograms done. They are $6,000 and give them your website so that they can visit your website. The yes. website is Andres, JCS live. And my email address, fundraising at jcs.live. I'm not, we're not hearing you. jcs.live is the website. 
And my email is fundraising at jcs.live. No, we didn't hear the first part. The part for the website is jcs.live. Just jcs.live. jcs.live, okay. So at this time, we want to, first of all, thank our viewers for joining us for the day. We want to thank our experts for joining us and giving us so much information that, you know, we have to think on a lot of things. What it has said to us is that we have to take our own health in our hands and it's a holistic approach. Mentally, health-wise, physically, you have to, you know, listen to what the doctor says, you know, follow up the treatment protocol. It's the first time meeting a death doula as well as, a, well, let me just go down the list so that I don't leave out anybody. Of first, we had Dr. Daria Cornwall, who she was a she is a consultant radiologist, and she's the head of the mammogram, mammogram unit at UWE, and she's also the managing director of Precision Imaging Center that also does a lot of the the screening mammograms, ultrasounds, and I believe and several other things as well. So you can also call Precision Imaging to find out exactly what they do. We had also Dr. Pernell Bell, counseling psychologist, and I noticed that they never really had much to ask you, but the truth is, the, the, as uh, and I'm going to reiterate, the mental stability or the mental health is about 80% of your treatment, your ability to survive and get through this in one piece. So going to a counseling psychologist is recommended. I recommend it highly. It helped me because, you know, sometimes you don't know that you are really hit. And remember, breast cancer hits your visual, your, you know, we, we, are, we, are, we are looked at as sexual beings. And if your breast goes, you're affected mentally as your image, you know, your image gets hit. So you want to get... One, accustomed to your new norm, accepting your new norm, things like that, right? Then we went on to have Dr. Jason Copeland, who he was talking about um, the declining rate of, 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 of um, births in Jamaica. Is it, is it increasing the breast cancer risk? He, he did say yes. And so that, is not, that, that was a conversation, a very interesting conversation. But of course, we have to now educate ourselves as to exactly what that means. Dr. Jason Copeland is a breast surgical oncologist and a consultant general surgeon down at the KPH, and he's also at Andrews Memorial Hospital. Then we spoke to the patient navigator, which I was alluding to earlier, Ms. Patrice. And she's many things, but what I like is the fact that she is there for you to walk you through the patient journey, which is very important. And I'm going to tell you quickly why. Because there are many things that sometimes you should be doing, but because you don't ask any questions, you miss, you miss, a, you miss that step. Dealing with a patient navigator or someone like me who has gone through like a, 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 a Jamaica cancer, Jamaica Reach to Recovery, who has gone through breast cancer already, we can help you to say, okay, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. Yes, you can expect to do this. This is what you should be doing next. This is the next step. Ask the question to do that. That's a key role, which I don't think many people know about, the patient navigator. Very, very important, Patrice. Um, thank you for that. And then we went on to what is rarely talked about, the dietitian, the nutritionist. Very important. Been a cancer survivor for 25 years. Go to doctor. Hardly ever asked about what am I eating or nutrition. But I understand that is a whole other story because the doctors really don't have any time for that. So the onus is on you. Right? So we want, and thank you, Julian, for putting on this really important evening um, from the J Jamaica Cancer Society. We want to also thank PBCJ and Joan Andrea Hutchinson for streaming this live for us. That is a really very key role. All our stakeholders, we really 
appreciate you. We appreciate you and thank you because this is information, very valuable information because breast cancer is the number one cancer killer in Jamaica in women, um, second only to prostate in men. And so this is a really very important conversation that had to be had and we'll, we will continue to have. But we have to move forward and not only have this conversation in October. Thank you so much for joining. We re really appreciate it. We still have 71 people online. So I know that it was, you know, people were riveted to the information. And so you can see it. It will be posted, right, Julian, on the page. So you can go to jcs.com. Am I correct? To see the, the, the uploaded video. And I will more than likely, I'm not sure if PB, I can find out and we can post it on the page at Jamaica Cancer Society if PBCJ does repeat the program. So I will find out that for you. Let me answer. Thank you, you so much. Yes? <laughs> because I could not unmute again. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Yes, we am putting it up and it's jcs.live. Oh, jcs.live. Right. Thank you. So, <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Have a very productive evening. And remember to come out and support the Pink Run on the 27th of October at 6.30 in the morning at Emancipation Park. Thank you so much for everything. Have a good evening. Thank Thanks you, for joining us. Sandra. Thank you yes. for excellent moderating this evening. Good You're job. Welcome. Excellent. You're welcome. <laughs>